welcome Jack Pan from Ocean Motion Technologies. He is working to build small scale wave energy solutions. So welcome Jack. Hey everyone, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. All right. So thanks for the introduction, Carly, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me here. Uh, so my name is Jack, uh, and today this very short talk is our work on leveraging uh, small-scale ocean energy to gather more data for the blue economy. Uh, and uh, uh, like Carly said, I'm with a company, startup company called Ocean Motion Technologies, and uh, uh, we are fabricating a small-scale a uh, modular ocean wave energy device. And most of our uh, commercial partners focus on low power applications for uh, monitoring in the ocean. Uh, so we're talking about data buoys for uh, ocean observation, maritime monitoring, offshore aquaculture monitoring, and surveillance for uh, coastal security. Uh, and that this device is controlled by a uh, advanced artificial intelligence system. So it can adapt to ambient wave conditions uh, and the optimized power output. And uh, uh, personally, uh, I was trained as a polar oceanographer and currently I am also a postdoc research fellow in NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, I work on satellite and airborne remote sensing projects for uh, coastal ocean monitoring. Uh, and of course, as a startup founder, I have to torture you with my funding story. So <laughs> there's more ocean wave energy on the West Coast alone than uh, two times the California annual energy consumption and the ocean waves actually concentrate solar and wind energy. So they have a, a higher energy density. They are also uh, highly predictable uh, with very low intermittency. And uh, most importantly, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, it's underdeveloped. So if a project is successful, uh, then the return on investment can be uh, quite substantial. Uh, but the real challenge is uh, how to develop cost-effective uh, ocean wave energy devices. So we need to get the basics right, um, de-risk, uh, validate, and build a viable business uh, in a small-scale market first, and then scale up to uh, grid-scale demands. And this is actually a lesson learned from other renewable uh, industries, uh, such as solar. Uh, so, you know, they didn't make solar farms in the 80s. They made these tiny solar panels for calculators first, uh, and then they made it for rooftops, and then they you know, made it solar farms for powering the grid. But who needs small-scale wave energy devices? Um, and so a few years ago, I was on the icebreaker to Antarctica, and the ship was really struggling to hold station uh, when it was time uh, for us to do our work. Uh, and we were there for yet again, uh, another one of these uh, routine maintenance services uh, for these ocean data buoys to clean the solar panels and to replace the batteries. And uh, it hit me, why are we using solar? There's plenty of wave energy. And then I realized that we could leverage this intersection between clean tech and blue tech industry to develop uh, wave energy. And so this is our solution. It's a a small scale independent power unit uh, that can be installed on existing data buoys. Uh, the device uh, has a AI control system, so it can adapt to ambient wave conditions. So this means we can produce power uh, in a wide range of ocean environments. So we're not constrained geographically uh, like a lot of the other uh, wave energy devices. And we're using the blue tech industry uh, as a beachhead market to validate our technology uh, and uh, we're trying to create a viable business uh, at every scale. And also, uh, I, I can't show you what it looks like right now because we're currently filing for patents, uh, but uh, in the top right photo, you can see our pilot customers working with a data buoy uh, to install our device on the top side of that platform. Um, so the technology is really trying to address uh, two pain points in uh, gathering more and more uh, data in the ocean. Uh, one is the huge maintenance cost, which is about anywhere between ten to thirty thousand uh, dollars per data buoy per year, uh, because you need uh, specialized vessels and crew just to clean the solar panels and to replace the batteries. And the other problem is there's just not enough power for these sensors to collect more data. 
uh, and uh, you know, uh, Carly and I talked about this before uh, before this event uh, briefly. You know, they're, they're you know the industry is trying to make smaller and smaller sensors, and perhaps the the other solution is to just give more power to these data gathering platform. Right now, we're using solar, which is uh, really limited. Anyway, so I'll get to that part uh, in a moment. So, uh, solving these two major uh, problems will allow us to bring big data to the buoy economy and sort of shift the ocean industry uh, to a big data paradigm uh, that we already have here on land. And uh, just so that we're all on the same page, uh, you know, this is what we mean by big data. We we want um, higher data resolution. So if you look at a data table, uh, like that grid on the bottom right corner, um, so we literally just want more rows of data. So we can, so we, we need to make faster measurements. But we also want more data variables. So that, that also, that just literally means more columns of data, meaning we need to deploy more sensors and instruments uh, and also create more derived data variables. And finally, uh, we want to transmit all of this data faster uh, and more frequently. So this is especially important for a lot of decision makers, uh, perhaps uh, paramount for C setting applications, um, which then, uh, you know, the decision makers can make very quick decisions based on uh, changing ocean conditions. And uh, uh, Big data in the ocean supports, already supports a wide range of existing use cases. And the key here is to conduct robust ocean monitoring for all sorts of applications. So we can then predict and act based on sufficient amounts of data. And we want to collect as much data as possible. Uh, so uh, we, we can have a robust way to make decisions in ocean based on this big data paradigm. And um, Another way to think about this is we can draw analogy to this big data paradigm um, in the traditional tech sector. So we already have uh, perfected uh, big data technologies on land for uh, monitoring. Actually, there's nothing that prevents us from waterproofing these existing uh, products for uh, ocean applications. Uh, and that, that's exactly what many blue tech entrepreneurs do uh, for their ventures. So to uh, um, borrow these mature big data solutions from land and apply them to the ocean. Um, and in comparison, uh, big data is implemented in a very similar way. Uh, we have cheaper and more reliable sensors and instruments to make measurements autonomously. Uh, so this falls under what I call the autonomy category, and we also need to start um, building up these uh, better network solutions. So, uh, you know, some of these are designed specifically for the ocean. Uh, so all of these autonomous platforms and sensors can uh, talk to one another. And, uh, but as we continue shift towards this big data paradigm, we will eventually run into the challenge of uh, power supply. Uh, and, um, you know, looking at this um, made me think, you know, what are we all doing here in the blue economy? Like, what is the, the driving force and the coordination mechanism for <clears throat> ocean business? It's like, if I can just put it crudely, like, what's the thing in the ocean industry? Um, so if we draw another analogy to the traditional tech sector um, on land, you know, we have a lot of firms and and, and uh, startups and, and just companies, people provide good, goods and services. And the driving force and, and sort of the coordination mechanism is just collecting more and more data. Uh, and uh, to some degree, you can effectively argue to sell ads, which in turn sells more goods and services. Uh, and then these, these um, uh, services and products are mapped to all sorts of use cases and applications that, that we enjoy every day. Um, and uh, you know, kind of thinking about this this question that, that perhaps I'm not articulating well uh, right now. I was speaking with a few colleagues from the space industry last month, and um, we realized the blue economy is very similar to the space industry from a few years ago uh, before SpaceX made it. So, you know, there were um, a bunch of um, small firms kind of driving the space sector for a while, but it was in a very uncoordinated fashion. And um, 
So it sort of looked like this, at least in my mind. And um, uh, you know, SpaceX sort of provided this viable model to make everything revolve around the launch events. So all the goods and services are there for the sole purpose of launching payloads. And that's the driving force. And then uh, the launch is then mapped to all sorts of applications and use cases. So uh, this is something I was really looking forward to uh, discussing with this group here. And uh, you know, is this the right way to think about blue tech and the ocean economy in general? Uh, uh, you know, maybe the driving force or the coordination mechanism is just collecting more and more data in the ocean. Uh, and all three categories of <clears throat> the ocean uh, technologies are uh, mostly there to support this effort. And then um, the collected data can be used to <clears throat> support all sorts of use cases uh, and activities in ocean. Uh, so really, I, I think what I'm trying to say is we, we need to find um, the SpaceX and sort of a viable business model for the blue economy. Uh, and uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, so uh, that's all I have for now. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Um, I'm sure there's some folks with questions or comments, so please feel free to unmute yourself if you wanna uh, ask Jack a question or, or comment on this presentation. I've had a question because um, this is Mike. I don't know if you can hear me. Hey Mike, we can't hear you. Oh, hi, Jack. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Um, one thing I noticed living on the beach for a while is in a high rise is when I look out over the ocean, I see waves seem to come in as like a stream of, um, you know, wavelets or, you know, wave. it's not sinusoidal motion, what I see. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe deeper, you know, farther out in the ocean, you have sinusoidal waves, but that's not what I see coming in, you know, to shore, is that you see, it's more like a wave train of pulses, a pulse train. Mm -hmm. So does, what have you observed? Have you done any uh, measurements to see what the actual wave forms that where are, is most of the buoy data I've seen, I only see averages, but I'm not actually seeing the, anything that I can really see the shape of the waves. Yep, you, you're, you're absolutely right on that. So, so, um, so two things on that uh, uh, comment, right? So one is, uh, you know, I, I don't know specifically, you know, where you are uh, along the coast, but I, I'm guessing what you're seeing are uh, what we call breaking waves. So uh, you're right, like you would get a more, um, you know, per more perfect quote unquote sine waves uh, out there in the open ocean. But typically what you see, you know, you know, on beaches are breaking waves. So <clears throat> those are usually not what we're, what we're trying to capture. And, um, you know, we, we typically don't need power or off-grid small-scale power for, for data gathering and monitoring at those locations with breaking waves, because then you can just plug it directly into the grid. Um, so what we're doing is more geared towards um, uh, open ocean, offshore, you know, beyond the visual horizon uh, type of, um, locations. And uh, uh, the second part is uh, in terms of the, um, the, the, the wave conditions and, uh, and data. Uh, so we don't just look at averages, we actually get data streams from data buoys, flows, drifters, all sorts of stuff. And uh, we have pretty detailed physical oceanography data and we have done analyses on the wave conditions at the uh, deployment sites. Uh, so one of our pilot deployment sites is in Puget Sound um, in Washington, uh, and um, uh, and and you know all of these locations have very different um, uh, wave properties. So what we ended up doing, and I think that's sort of a key innovation here, is uh, we can um, sort of physically change the configuration of our device. Uh, and and the, the, the AI control system takes care of that. So as the wave conditions change, as we take this device from one location to another, um, it, it will automatically adapt and, and optimally generate power. That does, does it answer your question? Yeah, kind of, no. Yeah, I'm like, 
on the ninth floor of a high rise. It was several months. So I could nice. see quite a ways out to the ocean. It's on the uh, Florida Atlantic coast, you know, near the nice. near, near Kennedy Space Center. So it is kind of shallow for a fair amount out. You know, I could go out probably several hundred feet up to my neck, maybe yeah. 100 to 200 feet out in the water. So I mean, it's fairly deep. It's definitely the water is deeper than the wave height, you know, but but they're still pretty far apart. You know, it wasn't sinusoidal. And I'm kind yeah. of scared, concerned because um, with our company, Arctide, we're doing a lot of wave simulation up to like four meter waves. And we're all, the modeling is all assuming sinusoidal. But, right. So I'm kind of relieved to hear, well, that is really what you have when you're in the deeper ocean. Yeah, you know, we're designing maybe for, you know, I guess 20 meters deep and over. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's not perfect, right? It's, you know, like I, I, I would always say you should take your device or technology to the open ocean, right? Use the wave tank as a way to validate your digital trend and your, your simulation. And, you know, we always, at the end of the day, we always have to take it into the, the field because that's, that's, that's when it will count. Um, yeah, and a lot you of times, or yeah. No, go ahead. So do you or anyone have actual data that's available that shows the waveforms? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There, there. yeah. So um, uh, I think there's a program called the CDIF, and the data is uh, freely available to the public. Um, uh, I'll, I'll look it up uh, momentarily, and I can put it in the chat. Uh, there are numerous okay, other thanks. programs. So like so far, Ocean has... Uh, Physical oceanography data. They deploy all sorts of drifters and floats, and uh, they also have a lot of uh, pretty robust wave data. So, yeah, th th these data are definitely out there. Oh, great! Thanks. Yeah, as Noah didn't really seem to have what we were looking, we were yeah. looking for. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, Craig Lewis asks, "What power can the units generate?" Right, so um, like a scaled model, small scale, right? It's on, on bench tops, we're talking about 10, 20 watts. So for a full scale unit, um, and we usually deploy a three unit variant on each data buoy to catch the waves from three different directions, uh, then we will be able to generate something in the orders of 30 to 50 watts, up to 100 watts. And uh, I, I, I think a lot of you will be like, 100 watts, that's nothing, that's ridiculous. But let me just put it in context for you. Um, so in oceanography, and this is what we deal with every day, you know, standard CTD, uh, and many of you probably know, right? It's the conductivity, depth, and, and the pressure sensor that measures the three fundamental variables in oceanography, temperature, salinity, and depth. Each one of those units takes something like half a watt to power, right? And so we're talking about minuscule amount of power to do big data oceanography and do ocean monitoring. So if you can provide an additional 50 watts, that's like huge to the ocean observing community. Uh, I'll give you another example. I can't, I can't name the names, but uh, there's a program offshore here in California, a colleague who's their, their lab is deploying an image flow cytometer. Basically you can run uh, seawater samples, and it takes an image of all the microscopic particles, phytoplankton, zooplankton, all of that. Uh, you know, on land, you can literally get millions of images a day just by running seawater intake. Um, you know, if, if this is like at a, a in-person meeting, I usually ask the audience, would you like to know, you know, how many images this colleague can take every day on their data buoy? Uh, and uh, I, I won't make it interactive, I'll just tell you the answer. The answer is they can take one image a day oh my God. Uh, because it takes power to take the image and to sample, right? To, to, you have to think about it. Like on land, we don't think about these things. You just plug into the grid, but in the ocean, to draw the seawater in, there's a pump and then the power for the instrument itself. And then that's not it because you have to set the data back. So you have to, you have to wait, you have to like, wait for the satellite to overpass, and then you talk to the satellite. That all takes power, right? Um, uh, uh, another, another example, I don't mean if you keep ranting about this, but another example is I was talking to an investor the other day, 
Um, uh, and uh, he said, well, you know, you know, the other thing I heard from some of my buddies is, you know, the solar panel gets stolen, you know, so they really should just add camera and security systems because we, we all have rain and all of these systems on land. And there's like, how are you going to power that? Use the same solar panels they are stealing from the data movies. He's like, oh, I didn't think of that one. Well, what if you add a motion sensor and only turn on the camera when someone's around? And like, what's going to power the motion sensor? <laughs> so it's just, it, so power is really paramount uh, in this context. Um, hope, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yes, Craig asked another couple questions. Um, forgive me, I don't know all of these uh, abbreviations. He asks, what is the min? Minimum or maximum wave that the units can be used in, and then he adds, uh, ocean builders will be having seed pods and deep water pods um, within one to twelve kilometers, and DWP can be from two to two hundred kilometers. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, Craig, what you meant by min and max wave, you mean like the significant wave height and the, the, the amplitudes? Well, that's just measured in, in length, right? And like the periods are measured in, you know, unit time. Uh, so, uh, and what what's the second question? Sorry. I, uh, I think he was giving an example that because he works for ocean builders and they're planning to have their structures within one to 12 kilometers and DWP. Okay. So I'm not sure if he, that means from shore or if that means a different distance, but he says nice. DWP could be from two to 200 kilometers. Okay. Um, so uh, if I understand you correctly, um, you know, we mostly work on small scale uh, side of things. So, you know, we're not talking about, you know, you know, these large wave conditions, uh, you know, that's kilometers in scale. Um, yeah. So Craig, if you're able to add some clarification to your comments, I'll, I'll bring that back up. There are another couple, there's another question in the chat from Benjamin wrote, I'm guessing the power collection is more or less continuous. But are you nevertheless looking at long-term energy storage as well as immediate power use? Yep, yep, absolutely. That's That's, definitely a concern that we have and we have done a lot of research on that. Uh, uh, so thanks for asking that question, Ben. Um, so uh, so typically the energy is stored in a battery, right? And uh, like you said, exactly like the, the advantage of wave energy is that it's more or less continuous. Um, uh, but in terms of additional, uh, you know, storage solutions, we look at some of the novel ones. So we have uh, actually done a lot of work on uh, mechanical storage as well as um, looking at some of the really odd ones like compressed air and all of these other uh, mechanisms. So yeah, uh, storage is, is definitely something to consider, but because the wave field is more or less continuous, it's, it's less of a concern. Uh, when it's compared to, say, you know, so, small scale solar and wind for these applications. Okay, so the second question is Are you looking at tidal interactions, i.e., ways of capturing energy from periodic tidal variation in sea level? Uh, sort of. <laughs> so uh, the way our mechanism works is it, it generates more power when the platform is less stable. Right, so we have thought about increase the instability of the data buoy itself, uh, and uh, uh, so far, you know, we only done some concept work on that. Uh, but mostly, it's it's uh, dependent on the adaptive feature within uh, within the device. So we're talking about, you know, it's almost like a, a car, like the transmission, you know, switching gears, you know. Uh, lengthening and shortening certain parts of it, and that way it will it will sort of, you know, it's like basic trigonometry to like play with that to to increase the power output. So that's sort of how we um, how we adjust the the device so far to maximize uh, the power. 
you mentioned aquaculture and floating infrastructure requirements. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that and give some examples? Absolutely. So, um, you know, it, there are lots of uh, relatively small scale power needs. So at least this is through the partners we spoke with, right? You know, at night, you know, the, these things are powered mostly by solar and, and diesel uh, for the feed, for the monitoring, uh, for all sorts, for like the oxygenation of the fish pens. So we're talking about offshore aquaculture, right? And uh, usually what they do is at night, they turn their systems off. Uh, so this is kind of was surprising to me personally. I didn't know this. So because of the, the power consumption, they just turn everything off at night and then they turn it on the next morning when they come to work. And uh, I, you know, wave energy can uh, really supplement a lot of this, right? So they can continuously monitor, you know, we can't power like the feed and the large scale power that takes kilowatts, but at least we can provide the, monitor, the environmental monitoring at night. Um, and um, the other thing well, that we can do is the oxygenation part, right? So like, um, that's a huge issue. The flow rates in the fish pen, that's a huge source of uh, disease uh, in the stock. Uh, so, you know, by just having a little bit more, it's, it's like a corium, you know, by having a little bit more power, you can add a few more bubblers and that will increase the flow. Uh, so, so, you know, that, that will sort of decrease the, the you know, the stock of the parasites and, and, and viral loads in the in the stock, so that's sort of what what um, what we could do for for offshore aquaculture, mostly for monitoring and powering small uh, small scale low power uh, needs. Why can't you ramp it up and do bigger things? Uh, well, the market is not all there. I mean, if if we're go, going down that route, right? Why why not ramp up and power the grid? <laughs> you know that there's still there's right. still no wave farm for the grid. It's just the market is not there. It takes a lot of um, investments, and and really, like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, if you invest in a company, you don't want them to build a multi million dollar device, and then they they like the only way they can test it is put in the ocean, and then they just get twisted and destroyed. That's literally how two companies in Europe went bankrupt in like the late nineties and early two thousands. Um, because, you know, you, you really have to start small. You want to build solar panels for calculators, really prove your technology in a viable market, make a business out of it, and then you slowly, incrementally go up in, in scale. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. We had a question from Mike D. Um, can you adjust the natural frequency, like the mass and EM drag, to match the wave frequency? Uh, I think I think we addressed this question. Uh, yeah, before uh, before the last one. Yeah, I guess you said you're um, you're adjusting a moment arm or something. Yeah. Instead yeah. of the weight to do that, it's yeah. Like. Yeah, we're basically trying to make the the data we less stable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, can you talk about the applications for seasteading? How could it how could it apply? Right, because that's what yeah. we're all about. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so monitoring. So, you need to know, you know, what are the ambient conditions around your colonies and your your you know operation facility, uh, and you know you want to take as much data as possible. Uh, you know, not just the, the sampling frequency, but the amount of data, right? So not just CPD, but also like the ecological conditions, because you know you would be doing farming. Uh, you want to know like if someone is intruding into your territory. You know you want to keep an eye out. You know want to collect like all of these data, uh, and and then that will help you build AI and prediction models, uh, and and help you make decisions. And and I know you're probably thinking about this because I had this very same question with a friend. Uh, just like before this talk, and he mentioned, you know, why wouldn't these guys just plug your monitoring device directly into their main power source? It's probably some sort of diesel generator or intermediate scale wind turbine, right? And the response to that is, what else would you like to uh, uh, borrow from land and uh, <laughs> centralize the grid and implement it in this? you know, seasteading new paradigm, 
you know, I think the whole notion of C setting, if I understand correctly, is to have a more decentralized modular design. Uh, we want to have redundancy, we want to have backups. So if your main colony sort of the power stuff fails, all of your eyes and ears in the middle of the ocean that keep you safe and uh, keeps monitoring your ambient environment will still be up. Um, uh, so, so that's sort of the, the um, utility of small scale wave power for, for sea study. Have you looked at hydropower? A little bit. Um, in, in what context? Well, just in, in what it does. And it, you know, it's been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, it's basically the motion up and down in the water that, you know, it creates energy. And I, uh, I've talked to some people about it and they say it, uh, you know, it has a lot of possibilities, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not a technical expert. So that's why I bring it up. Um, I, you know, I think in, in terms of C setting and given, you know, you know, the vision of what it looks like from what I could see online, of what a sea setting colony would look like, right? Uh, I think that type of technology is actually quite viable. So people have built this before. Um, uh, I believe the mechanism is called over talking and it's quite simple. It's you just build a giant pool in the middle of the ocean and then, you know, you have wave crushing in and you're building up, you know, a bunch of water in the pool and on the bottom, there's a turbine and when you open it, it lets the water out and generates electricity. So that's pretty much, you know, similar to how hydropower works. Um, yeah, I've and, talked to some yeah. people that uh, they talked about having a large structure out in the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has to, they said, if you could get it to go up and down, say two, maybe three meters over a 24 hour period, mm -hmm. you could generate a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was so fascinating. Obviously for a large structure going down two to three you know, meters, you know, uh, and then coming back up over a period of two. So it would be a very slow motion. Yeah. And if it was people living there, they probably wouldn't even notice that it's moving because it's very slow, yeah. but yet it would be generating power. And I find that very fascinating. Yeah. And it's more yeah. efficient than solar. Yep, yep. And, and especially if, you know, if we fully implement the vision of sea study, right? Like space is not an issue. You can build all of these modular hubs, like the residential hubs around this power unit. And like you said, it's it's fairly unnoticeable. So yeah, it's. I think these are all opportunities. Like sea setting is a really good opportunity to try a lot of these new technologies that you know kind of failed or didn't quite work because it was implemented in the wrong context in the past. But yours is a little different than what I'm talking about. That's right. Correct? Yeah. 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 You're, you're using the energy from the water, but on a much smaller scale. Yep. Yep. Okay. So we're just taking advantage of when a wave comes, right? There's a peak and there's a trough. We are taking advantage of that little differential to generate power. Right. Yeah. yeah it's all fascinating. It's great. Good luck on your project. It's very interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. We had a question in the chat from David S. Thoughts on current commercial wave farms? Um, that's actually really interesting. So, um, so we are part of uh, uh, this uh, big initiative uh, under the U.S. Department of Energy called the Powering the Blue Economy, and. Uh, the entire idea behind this initiative is exactly like I mentioned, you, know, you start small, you build viable business in small scale market first, and then you scale up. But, you know, they're also funding, you know, these technologies at various uh, stages in terms of the scaling up, right? And um, uh, they, they are looking at, um, um, you know, larger scale as well, like the kilowatt range. So uh, you guys probably know there's like a wave farm, um, experimental wave farm in Hawaii. Uh, that's uh, sort of in the lower kilowatt range. And then they just uh, started a kind of a megawatt range wave farm in the state of Oregon. Uh, so all of these things are all happening. You know, uh, Alta C at the Port of Los Angeles uh, is deploying these uh, grid scale wave energy devices. I believe it's a company called the EcoWave. Uh, and of course, you know, OPT, ocean power technologies on the East Coast. 
uh, all have uh, you know viable uh, 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 you know grid scale um, uh, wave energy options. Uh, so you know um, I think um, um, I, I think we're almost there. <laughs> I think it's just, it, and, and the way we're doing this is correct. Like how the DOE is basically creating a infrastructure and a little, and basically have this box around the area and say, try this out in here. And if it works, then we will like, you know, try to implement it more widely. Um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, wave farms, we should take it slow, learn from uh, our predecessors from, uh, Europe <laughs> from the last 20 years uh, and try to in, in, uh, implement uh, wave farms incrementally to make sure that we get it right this time. Any other comments or questions? I see Mike with a couple comments, but I'm not sure I should uh, repeat those. I mean, if you wanted to bring in a conversation about that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just in um, response earlier when I talked about like having waves break into, collect into a pool that you would collect, collect like with hydro power. And this is kind of what I just put in a note, usually to use like a high flow and a low head um, with an axial flow turbine instead of an impulse turbine. But yeah. you'd have like a ramp that would, the waves break up onto it so that it raises, they raise up into a higher level. You might get a few feet ahead that way. Yeah, that's, that's actually, yeah, just kind of going back to that notion, right? It's um, so if you look at the, the the org chart of the DOE, so so ocean energy under the Department of Energy is organized under Water Power Technologies Office. So so WPTO actually not just does ocean wave, but also do hydro. So you know, in 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 the governmental sector, you know, at, at least in terms of DOE, they are they're already thinking about those two types of technologies under one umbrella. So you're absolutely right on that, on that notion, right? Those two are fairly interconnected because we're just talking about kinetic energy, right, from nature um, in, in water. So uh, yeah, there are definitely a lot of commonalities. I find the whole subject very fascinating that, you know, that, that it's almost like there's if, you know, they want to go to Mars or in space, but there's so many things here that have not been really discovered or fully used. And water, I think, in the oceans, I think, is uh, something that needs a lot more attention. How are you getting your funding? And where, where's your, I, I kind of missed the beginning of the meeting. Where's your project at? Where are you going? Um, so right now we are uh, mostly uh, uh, supported by non-diluted funding. Uh, we have received uh, support from the US Department of Energy. And prior to that, we have received support from various foundations and um, uh, the California Energy uh, Commission. Uh, so yeah, so the Department of Energy and the Water Power Technologies Office through the SBIR program has been a huge help. And we're also working with uh, the TEAMER program. Uh, 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 also, it's a program under the DOE to do a lot of testing and simulation. Uh, so that's kind of a voucher program. Um, and uh, so that's, that's sort of where most of the support comes from. Uh, and it helped us to not do R&D, but also there's a huge commercial emphasis, right? So we, you know, I'll say, I'll say this on the record, you know, we, we have no intention of just writing these grants one after another forever and ever. Like, you know, a lot of the companies, we really want to get the commercial case down. That's why we do the small scale. And we actually have um, about two, three customers of uh, three different firms that are essentially integrated into our team as a team member. So as we do R and D, as we move forward, they are, you know, they're up to date, and you know, they're they're very much ready to intake these products that that we're making. Uh, so that's where 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 we're we're at right now, and where the support is coming from. Uh, and uh, we have already tested uh, benchtop uh, prototypes. We have took uh, various iterations of the subsystems uh, into the ocean. Uh, and uh, the, our, our phase two project, one of the end goals for mid-2023, it's 2022 right now, uh, is to deploy this uh, as a pilot deployment with, with a customer um, in Puget Sound in Washington. And we're setting up more 
commercial partners in, in Los Angeles with a port of Seattle and perhaps some more with, uh, with partners at Sea City. What would you do with the port of Seattle? Um, same thing, uh, providing monitoring um, uh, solutions uh, just gave them more power. I mean, right now, you know, our customer the system is, is a system integrator and they actually work with ports uh, all over the world, right? And, and he's telling me like, you know, these municipalities and, and institutions are asking for more and more variables and instruments. They're like, well, can you do, can you measure chlorophyll, temperature, salinity? And can you also measure turbidity? Can you also measure, you know, figure out a way to measure variables and drive for uh, uh, toxic substance? Can you measure, you know, community composition so we can predict hob or harmful algal bloom? You know, and it just it just goes on and on. It's like, okay, so sounds like you need more power to power all these instruments. Uh, so that's sort of what we do. So how many wind turbines are, are there going to be in the United States? I know there's, uh, you know, a big move on now. There's going to be how many over the next 10 years? Thousands. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but, but yeah, probably a lot. And you can, you can adapt, you can do things on those wind turbines? Uh, again, you know, supporting the monitoring for now. And I think when we scale up, okay. yes, they, there are okay. other companies around. That, like I know like two or three companies that are actively thinking about wind and wind wave, you know, combination, because the platform is there, you can just add on, you can just add on to the offshore wind platform to, to right. also harness wave energy. And that's actually better for the wind platform because it increases the stability because you absorb all of the movements, right? And convert it okay. to useful electricity. So that that's actually a win-win for both industries. And people are looking okay, to Jack. that. Thank you, Jack, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Chris Canada. What would you think of the potential for an underwater turbine to harvest energy from ocean currents? Yep, yep. People are looking into that too. Absolutely. I mean, we we thought about that. Actually, that's one of our very initial concepts years and years ago. But uh, you know, the deployment is is difficult, and you know, we really you know our bread and butter and our expertise, uh, you know are in um, small scale power, like mostly for ocean observation. Anyway, but to answer your question, yes, people are looking at that. Matter of fact, there is a commercially available, you know, uh, unit that's being demonstrated, it's like grid scale. I think it's, um, the company is called Orbital Marine, I believe. And uh, they're deploying this in, um, I think in the East Coast. And, and it's exactly like we imagined it is. It's like basically two ginormous underwater wind turbines and it's catching that currents uh, to generate electricity. Uh, and David S. asks, uh, I know there have been some people looking to possibly try and get various types of government contracts and or grants to help develop their projects. What advice could you give them that's helped you navigate that scene? Um, so, you, you know, we're not like a super experienced firm that's getting contracts left and right. We have only had some limited experience with um, the SBIR program. Uh, but, but just from, you know, the limited experience we have, you know, I, I think it's really important to understand what the, the, the government uh, contract um, is really asking for, right? It's so, so like, for example, SBIR, right? They, it's not just about the technology, right? You have to also build a solid commercial case, right? They don't want you to just to have a bunch of these companies that just keeps writing grants, right? The end goal, right, is not just to make your company become, you know, profitable from writing grants, but the end goal is to make it into a real company that have real customers that sell real products. So I, I think to really, it's to really understand that kind of digest the solicitation and understand what they're looking for um, uh, is, is important to the success of, of winning these contracts and, and grants. Um, Dan, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Can I, can I throw something out actually on the, the grants real quick? Um, Sorry, I, I just had a good conversation with the local university today about uh, STTRs, uh, which are similar to SBIRs, but they're uh, more in partnership with private companies and universities. And uh, the huge advantage I think we're going to have with that is that we both work together to write the grant. 
uh, which is great because that's not my specialty at all. And that is their specialty. So, um, so they have a Marine department. So that's, uh, I think, uh, probably something to look into wherever you are is the local universities and find the Marine departments and reach out to them because they're, they're always, you know, eager to find companies that are excited about the things that they're doing and wanting to partner with them and wanting to take things, not just, uh, you know, academic research, which they love, of course, but take it into a commercial space and see it grow and go out into the world. So thanks. Thanks, Ben. Agre agreed. Um, Dan, go ahead Hi. and un unmute. Yep. Uh, first question, uh, what is the battery capacity uh, for a boy? And uh, how uh, do you... Um, uh, keep the boy in a certain uh, zone, like uh, you are mooring it, or if the currents are drifting it away, how, how you control the location so the satellite can pinpoint when it needs to take back the data, especially on high seas. Thank yeah, you. so so I'll, I'll live Google the battery question while I answer your first question. Uh, <laughs> Because I don't have those numbers like right in the back of my head. So uh, the um, the mooring question, yes, it's moored. It's uh, we there's like a, I think it's we use like a two point mooring system, right? So um, we actually the the buoy we're currently working with is from a company called Nexins. So you know we talked to a manufacturer and we're very interested in partnering with them, and um, uh, we work with a separate system integrator. Um, so all of these. People are also <clears throat> commercial partners. Uh, and um, uh, so, yeah, so it's like a two point mooring system and it kind of drifts around in a general vicinity, but it's not gonna like just go off. Uh, and this is a pretty industry standard way of moor these data buoys. So it's not just like fixed in place, right? With a heave plate where it's like, you know, you're just there and try to hold it there, but there's like, there's like a, a range of the drift. Right, but there's a there's a mooring underneath to hold it. Um, uh, and in terms of beaming to the satellite, you don't. It doesn't need to be like pinpoint accuracy. Um, you know, I think RF, as long as you're in a general range, you're pointing at the general direction, right? You're fine. Just like this, with sat phones, you just have to kind of point at the direction, and it just it hooks up to the internet. And in terms of battery, right now it's um, the 1250 has a 371 watt um, uh, solar panels on top, uh, and it's a 28 amp hour battery uh, in the instrument wells. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we got a, a flurry of questions in the last 10 minutes of our of our event. So first one, Dr. Pan, thanks for the presentation. What will your team's biggest challenges in the next? Oh, what will be your team's biggest challenges in the next couple of years? And what milestones are you working toward? Uh, oh, 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 well, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I, I like, so, you know, I, I haven't gotten my PhD for years and years. So whenever people call me Dr. Pan, I always get scared. <laughs> um, but thank you for that. Um, uh, so, you know, our, our team is really devoted to make this technology work, not just technologically, but commercially as well. So we want to work with, more and more commercial partners and built this into more existing products. Um, so um, I guess this is a challenge and also a milestone. We really hope this technology can become a foundational and the integral part of the big data paradigm shift in the blue economy. And we want to help uh, power this uh, big data um, um, uh, movement uh, in the ocean. So, so that's sort of the, the next, uh, big picture milestone for us. Great, I'm gonna move through these questions so we get to them all. Um, so from Chris De La Cruz, how about integrating wireless power transfer? Aha, uh -huh. very good. So that's something we are actively looking into. Uh, one of the big challenges in terms of big data collection is to having these autonomous platforms. And uh, uh, so we're talking about AUV, UUVs, these colliders, drifters, you know, not drifters, but uh, gliders and autonomous vehicles. And, and the, one of the major challenges there is charging. You need to charge your vehicles. Or right now, usually the ship is like right, it's sitting right there on station. And you do, you, 
you have the gliders swimming around and then it comes back and you charge it on the ship. Uh, so have you, so this is an active uh, application area that's not just what we're looking into, but a, a large portion of the blue tech community is looking into both from the UUV side and the power generation side to figure out how we can get these things to dock at data buoys and to charge it. So that's absolutely something we're very interested in. Great, next question. Jay at Up Energy. How, does, how would your devices work floating on methane lakes of, methane lakes of Titan? Uh, that's a great question. You know, we, you know, I'm actually really interested. This is, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I'm really interested in the icy moons and these like, you know, so, so, you know, because, you know, in oceanography, we actually get recruited a lot by these icy moon research folks. So we, we do talk and, you know, I, I'm at JPL as well. And, you know, they're launching the, the Clipper mission to Europa and all of this, right? So, yeah, it, it would definitely work. You just have to change the float buoyancy and it would supposedly generate power if there are waves. Um, I think there are probably better ways <laughs> to power the sensors on, on Titan, uh, but uh, you know, that's something that, that we can think about. Cool. Okay, from Gabriel Proton, in relation to wave farms and the funding necessary to scale up your operations, do you think you could convince third world countries with unstable power grids to offer some assistance? When the technology is proven, these wave generators could be useful to their unstable power grids so it should be easy to make your case and get support. Yeah, yeah. You know, Car Carly, we, we talked about this right before this event, right? So this is absolutely something we're interested in uh, to, to have uh, these countries that, that are really impacted, uh, uh, you know, by these coastal changing conditions uh, and work with them to implement our technology so that's a two-fold issue, right? So to scale up, right, there are a lot of these large-scale international mechanisms. We don't necessarily have to go to these countries and ask for funding. There are a lot of UN programs that will fund this to make sure you scale up your technology and implement these in these technologies in these countries. So when, when uh, we went to the, the COP conferences uh, a couple of years ago, um, you know, we see lots of NGOs uh, that offers this type of grant, right? So, and, and, and ministers from these countries are very interested in working with companies on these. So that, that's one thing. And the other thing is to, you know, actively finding viable government and commercial partners in these countries. And that's for the small scale piece, right? Because they also have a need for monitoring. And right now, you know, when, when they, uh, and this kind of goes back to our conversation currently, right? So right now when they, when they monitor, they buy all these expensive equipments, they hire all of these people from say the United States, Europe, come in, do the deployments, do the recovery, do the data analyses, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of this equipment just sits in their warehouse. And then it's, that's it. So like there has to be a more viable way of doing business there. And we're sort of proposing and our commercial partners actually formally started a consortium with a bunch of really experienced the companies to start this, this new business model. It's almost like a subscription based. So you, you can just pay a flat fee and then everything's take care, is taken care of and you just get the data at the end. So I think that's a really great model for uh, these countries that need the data, need the monitoring efforts, uh, but doesn't necessarily need to invest in uh, this kind of one-time non-recurring uh, uh, infrastructure cost. Cool. All right. Three minutes. Two more questions. <laughs> Do these devices have to be location specific since, since wave climates can be location specific? Yeah. Yeah. So, so great, great question. That's actually uh, one of our key advantages, which is we have a AI control system. So it changes the physical configuration of the device according to the ambient waves. Uh, so no, it's not location specific. And then last question, how much do these units sell for? Uh, we're not sure yet. <laughs> uh, I, I think it, we, whatever it is, it will be uh, cheaper than the existing products. But, but I'll, I'll say this, you will not be able to buy this. <laughs> like, we'll, I mean, we'll sell it to you. 
you know, if you offer money. <laughs> but uh, no, our goal is to build this into existing uh, products. So uh, when you buy a data, believe we deploy this working with our partners through this subscription model, or you just buy the hardware, this device will already be in these existing uh, technology and, 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 and the products. So, uh, you, you know, this is not kind of a business to consumer model, if you will. Gotcha. Well, uh, two minutes, great, great timing, Jack. You fit a lot of in great information and conversation in our one hour. Um, for everyone, thank you for joining us. I put a, a link in our chat for our feedback form where you can tell us what you thought of the event and you can recommend topics for future events. Um, and also, if you did not register on Eventbrite, you can send me your email address. You can send it privately through the chat or send me, reach me at carly at csetting.org. Anyone who registered on Eventbrite will be sending out an email next week with a link to all of the chat, a little summary, um, and the link to the video when we post the video up on YouTube. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining. Our next event will be on uh, the 14th. And actually, Chris Kennedy, if you wanna uh, talk about it, Chris Kennedy is on the call. He'll be our next presenter on July 14th. Do you wanna speak, Chris? Hello, uh, I am here. Hopefully my connection will hold up. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. And um, yeah, anyway, I want to talk about ecological sanitation on seasteads to protect the ocean and not be contaminating. And there are lots of options. In particular, the urine diverting dry toilets that we've talked about before. And there's a video up about those. And there's other systems. There's closed loop flush water recycling, um, which we're working on getting going in my house here where I'm sitting. Also, we're looking at doing it at a school in Kenya. If there's any people who want to volunteer and learn about that in Mombasa, they're welcome. That's kind of, we're gonna be building in September roughly. So anyway, and um, so, there are a lot of options and I think it's key, you know, at least in my perspective, to protect the ocean and not be contaminating uh, our resource. And obviously people who wanna be swimming off the sea steads and everything, so we didn't, don't need wastewater there. Anyway, that's a little capsule. And uh, next month we can go into more detail. Great, thank you, Chris. And thank you everyone for joining um, and have a great evening, have a great weekend. Thanks so Thank much, you. everyone. Thanks, Jack.